So far, our passive house building here is pretty boring. So I think it's time to start to add some detail. And the first thing that I think we should add, well, we could sort of start in any number of places, but the first thing that I think we should add at this point is going to be some windows. So in the next few videos, we will take a look at the different methods for creating windows and assigning window properties, how we're going to manage them both in the Rhino side and in the Grasshopper side how the new Honeybee version 1.1, or excuse me, Ladybug Tools version 1.1 and Honeybee modeling components in Grasshopper allow us to manage those window components. We'll, we'll look at the tools for what are now known as apertures in Honeybee parlance. And we'll look at how all that flows through into the PHPP. So if you've been following along through the last series of videos, hopefully you have a Rhino model that looks at least something like the one here, where we've got our two thermal zones for our small building. We've built up the individual surfaces and assigned all sorts of parameter information to those surfaces in terms of their exposure categories, their surface types, and then their construction assemblies. So at this point, we do have an awful lot of good data flowing through to our PHPP, but as I said, it's time to add some, some detail to our, to our model here. So let me bring up my grasshopper definition. Um, there we go. So hopefully you have a grasshopper definition that looks something like this as well, where we are in the first instance creating our honeybee rooms or zones. So we have a multi-zone model here. We're using that solve adjacency uh, native honeybee tool to find the interface surfaces. We then push that off to a honeybee model where we um, set up some configuration and then convert that model into PHPP objects. And then we export all that data out to the PHPP Excel document. So let's, as I said, in the next uh, few videos here, look at where we can insert our window or more properly our aperture objects into this definition. So let me come in here to my Create Honeybee Rooms or Zones section. So on the left-hand side here. And let me zoom in a little bit so that we can see. And if you remember, uh, for our zones, we take in some zone geometry. We then push that to the ladybug to PHPP component, get surface parameters. That's going to harvest a bunch of information out of the rhino scene. That all gets fed into the native honeybee, uh, honeybee face tool. So we're going to create a series of honeybee faces. Uh, those then get combined into a honeybee room, and then the rooms flow off to the model. We do the solve adjacencies, etc. So where in this in this stream are we going to insert some windows? Well, let me go back. Um, let me leave our passive house tools for a second. Let me go to the native or the standard honeybee tools. I'm going to go to the honeybee ribbon here, and under the zero create section, you'll see that we have a whole bunch of interesting new tools here. And a lot of these tools are quite new in the uh, Ladybug Tools version 1.1 or 1.0. So if you're familiar with the older legacy tools, a lot of the stuff here is, um, is going to be uh, uh, relatively new, especially this section about what are known as apertures. So these uh, so-called apertures, this is sort of new in the new Ladybug Tools version 1 or, or better. And um, this is what we're going to use to create any of our windows, doors, or skylights uh, openings. So these apertures are what we're going to use to create those. And, and, and to add apertures to a basic Honeybee model, it's relatively straightforward. Of course, we could use things like create, you know, we can automate the creation of windows using things like Honeybee apertures by ratio or any of those other sort of um, uh, uh, parametric tools that are built into Grasshopper or Honeybee. Uh, for our purposes, we're just going to model some geometry and add that uh, explicitly. So we're going to we're going to stick with this sort of model in Rhino. Um, of course, as I said, you can always use all of those uh, more um, uh, uh, automatic or procedural tools in, in Grasshopper if you prefer. But for our purposes, I'm going to create a Honeybee aperture and then add that Honeybee aperture as what's known as a subface to are honeybee room surfaces or faces. So let's see how that's going to work. So I'm going to grab this honeybee aperture and I'm going to drop that onto the onto the canvas here. Again, I'm in the honeybee, the, the basic honeybee rollout. Go to a zero, create, come down here and grab this honeybee aperture component and drop that onto the canvas. And let's see what this guy requires of us. So it looks like we're going to take in some geometry. 
we have the option to input some names for the individual uh, window or excuse me aperture surfaces uh, we can tag whether or not they are operable um, and then we can supply some construction um, information as well to these apertures Okay, so the most important thing here is that we're going to feed it some geometry. So we have to create or we have to set up the actual geometry that we're going to feed in here uh, to this aperture tool. As I said, once this aperture is created, let me go back to my honeybee uh, ribbon to zero create and come down here into the add subface. So we're going to use that after the aperture has been created to add the aperture as a child of some faces of some surface. So these apertures are going to flow into this subfaces and then the faces we can just connect that up to the faces of the room. So for instance I can take the faces, bring those in, and then I can feed it a series of apertures and those will become hosted appropriately um, on their on their parent uh, surfaces. So this is quite smart. It sort of goes through one by one and sort of figures out uh, what the appropriate or what the correct host is for each of the windows that we feed in. So we don't have to do this like one face at a time. We can sort of give it a set of, of faces. We could even give it a room if we wanted to do this after the room. I can, you know, provide the room and it'll pull out all the faces there. So we can sort of put it anywhere in this chain that we want. But as I said, the important thing here is that we are going to um, feed in some geometry to our uh, in here. So let me call this uh, first floor windows. And so we're going to feed that in here. And so that'll be an input. Now, of course, we don't have any window. We don't have any geometry to feed it yet. So we need to now go back to our Rhino side and create some window geometry to feed into this aperture component, which then gets hosted on these individual honeybee faces. OK, so this is fine. Let's put this aside for a minute, and we'll come back to this once we have some geometry to uh, create. So I'm back in my Rhino scene now, and I've got my uh, two-zone model made of a whole series of surfaces. So I've got these individual surfaces. And if you remember, if I was to come over to the properties, and come into the uh, attribute user text and take a look at the attribute user text of any of these surfaces. Remember, we have a whole bunch of data which has now been applied to these different parameters, right? So we set up all these parameters using some of our new Passive House Tools components. So that's all well and good. Um, and as I said, the next step here is to start to model some windows. And we can do that as uh, using any of the normal Rhino geometry modeling tools that you like. Um, I'm going to just use standard surface modeling tools, but you know you can use whatever whatever techniques um, work best for, for you and your project. So let me come over here to layers, and I'm going to come into geometry. Or actually, let's make a whole new layer. So I'm going to call this O2 Windows, and let me do this again. We'll say first floor. There's probably a better way that I could organize all of the layers here, but whatever. Uh, so let's say first floor, and let's model some geometry. So I so I made a new uh, a new uh, layer, and I have a new first floor layer there. So we want to model some window geometry. Now, one other thing that I have done uh, is I've brought in some elevations. So I actually have some elevation CAD geometry in my Rhino file now, um, just to give us some outlines of the windows. Uh, again, this example building that I am modeling here is the same example building that we've used in our uh, introduction to Design PH and introduction to PHPP, uh, introduction to Flixo and Therm. So if you're taking any of those courses, you'd be familiar with this example building here. So it's just a very simple single family home. It gives us some super simple geometry to model together. So OK, so I have some um, so I have some CAD geometry here and I need to now model these individual window elements. So first of all, let me check this to go to regular shaded so that we don't accidentally do too much uh, accidental snapping on back faces and in order to model this geometry, um, it is important that the, that the window surface is perfectly aligned with the wall surface. So for instance, let me select these guys and isolate them so that we're looking, whoa, so stop it. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. So that we are looking just at these guys. 
So if I have a wall surface and I want to draw a window on that wall surface, it's very important that I draw the wall, the new window surface, on this surface. It has to be perfectly aligned with it in order for the hosting to work later on, in order for uh, Energy Plus and Open Studio to be able to properly host that window in that wall, the, the window surface has to be perfectly aligned with the wall. So I think the easiest way to do that in Rhino, uh, at least the easiest way that I, I, I find, is to come up to my construction planes. And as I'm building these things, always make sure that I set my, my construction plane to the surface itself. So with the surface selected, I'm going to come up here to construction planes. I'm going to come to this set C plane to surface. I'm going to select this guy and then just set my origin anywhere. It doesn't really matter. And if I zoom out a little bit, notice what's happened now. The construction plane has reset itself to be aligned to this surface. So now if I come in here and I draw some geometry, I know that this surface is on the host. It's perfectly aligned with the host. It can't not be, because I set that C plane to this surface. I mean, assuming that this host surface is planar, um, I suppose. Um, in any event, um, so we have so I've so I've got my my first set of geometry here. I know it's I know it's on the host because I reset the C plane, uh, the construction plane, as we went. And now I've got this guy here. And uh, why is it so big? It's clearly not the right size for this one. And so the way that I like to do this is I like to draw an oversized rectangle without snapping to anything. And then use something like a scale 1D command, or, you know, scale command, to resize. So I'm just typing um, scale 1D, and then clicking and dragging, and I'm resizing this object so that it fits to the window. And let me do one last time here, and there we go. Now, why did I do it that way? Why did I do it that way? Let me let me go ahead and delete this surface. Let's do it again. If I was to come in here to my surface tools and just go to a regular rectangular plane, why don't I just snap to the upper left corner and snap to the lower left corner or the lower right corner? Why wouldn't I just do it that way? That seems much more straightforward. Well, the reality that we have found over the years working with client supplied CAD drawings is that they're not always flat is that often we get CAD files from clients where things are a little bit off, where the window is not in perfectly flat with the wall geometry. You know, it's just one of those artifacts of drawing in 2D CAD drawings. Often you don't notice that the lines you're drawing are on a different, you know, a different, uh, a different layer or in a different position, you know, from, from, um, from from straight on, they might look flat, but if you were to sort of turn to the side, you would see that they're sort of out of out of axis there. So when I draw geometry like this, if I'm using client supplied CAD, whoops, stop it. I like to draw an oversized rectangle, and then as I said, if I select that guy, use my scale one D or scale two D, whatever you prefer, command to resize it. And now I know that I'm not accidentally putting this surface uh, out of alignment. Right? I know the surface is on the host, and I'm just resizing it using the scale 1D command. Now I happen to know, since I built this CAD for, for, the, for this little example model, that everything here is flat, so we can go through and just use that as a snap. But as I said, you want to be careful doing that kind of thing um, if you're using client-supplied CAD. So okay, so we're going to draw a bunch of geometry here for our individual windows. Now one thing we need to keep in mind, so when it comes to windows or doors or any aperture in the PHPP, each individual sash or element is going to be considered one window in PHPP. So in each window uh, or each sash is a quote unquote window in PHPP. So as we're drawing something like this big lift and slide double door, each of these elements, each of these elements is a separate window. So I have to draw them as two separate polygons or two separate surfaces so that they get entered correctly in our PHPP. And that's going to hold for any of these joined elements. So here I need to draw this as two separate elements, um, etc.
Uh, one additional thing, notice here that I've actually drawn these at the wrong size. So for PHPP, we should actually be splitting, let's see if I can get this to the register, we should actually be splitting this right down the, right down the middle, right? We should be splitting this, whoops, off axis there. We should be splitting this right down the middle. So let me go ahead and delete this. And delete that. And so how are we going to do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways we could do that. Um, I think probably the easiest thing to do. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go to my regular rectangular plane tool. I'm going to snap in the upper left. And then if I zoom in down here on the bottom, notice in uh, Rhino, if I sort of hover over these um, uh, vertices for a second, we get that little white um, dot there, meaning that it's sort of uh, been registered and so Rhino is pretty smart and it will if I get two of them it'll help it'll find the midpoint and sort of bring that up and then I can snap there so now I've got that as the midpoint between so if I like hover over that vertex for just a second um, it helps me to find the vertex and now I might scale 1D grab this guy and there we go Right, so now I know that's perfectly in the center. I could also have used my line tools uh, to just draw some construction geometry, some helper geometry, and then delete it after I'd after I built it. Um, any of that would work. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw this guy here. Now, so I've split this right down the center because in PHPP, when we have these mulled units like this, I want half of the heat flow for this frame to go to this unit and half the heat flow for this frame to go to this unit. And so we need to make sure and split that right down the middle for our PHPP model. And that'll hold for all of these guys here. So if I come over to the side, uh, let's do another, we'll do this one. I'll go to the snap in the upper left. I'll zoom in here. I'll hover over this point for a second. I'll hover over this point for a second. Then I'll come over and notice that Rhino helps me find the midpoint between those two references. And then I'll use my scale 1D to just complete that. And then I'll do its neighbor here, like so. All right. And when we're done, when we're done with our modeling, we'll come to C plane and then just reset it to our world top view. And so we can just reset and set ourselves back to back to zero. So we now have a few window surfaces. These window surfaces are going to get hosted in our geometry. So uh, let me come over here and I'll go to the first floor, right click and say select the objects. So I've selected just the window surfaces. And how are we going to get these into our Rhino uh, or excuse me, our uh, Grasshopper? When we bring Grasshopper up, all I need to do is come in here to my uh, geometry or uh, B-Rep re uh, reference. I'll right click and say set multiple geometries. And so this is going to pull in those window elements. Those window elements are going to flow into a so-called aperture. The apertures flow into this add subsurface component. And now we're going to take the faces from our honeybee faces. We're going to feed that into the, the host honeybee object input. And then this is all going to get combined. We then take the output, which is a new set of faces. Notice it doesn't look that different. We've got a set of faces, <coughs> six faces. We've got our first floor walls, our floor slab, our ceiling, but behind the scenes, those faces now have hosted apertures. So inside of or on those faces, sort of behind the scenes, there's apertures now hosted on those faces. So these new faces with the hosted apertures are now going to get input into our rooms and then flow into the rest of our, uh, our geometry or the rest of our process. So let me actually make a little bit of space here so that we can really see what's happening. So this guy will go here and let's do it this way. We'll bring this down, keep it tidy. There we go. So we have our basic geometry. Our basic geometry gets turned into honeybee faces. We've got our window geometry. Our window geometry gets turned into apertures. Those get combined and then they flow into our honeybee rooms. Our honeybee rooms put them all together. And so our honeybee room has a whole bunch of faces and on those faces are a whole bunch of hosted apertures. That of course is gonna flow through our solve adjacency into our honeybee model. That then gets converted into a series of Excel objects and those flow out to our PHPP. 
So let's take a look and see what happened now with our new windows. Let's see if those flowed through correctly. So let me uh, boot up Excel, and as soon as that is booted up, we will see what kind of results we got in our PHPP. All right, so my PHPP is up. Here we are. So here's our PHPP, and it looks like it's, uh, so we're still still writing out. So everything's being written out. And as soon as it's done writing, there we go. Ed's double stud wall. Ed's really good, it's kind of good floor. It's, uh, so this is all standard Honeybee stuff. We should have, there we go, Ed's ceiling construction. If we go to our areas worksheet, we have all of our different surfaces. The different surfaces have, whoops, have a series of um, constructions applied. Of course, we have all of our orientation information as we've seen in the last uh, few videos. Now, the new thing, if we were to come over to our Windows worksheet, come into our Windows worksheet, notice that we now have a series of window elements. Of course, just like our envelopes when we first input them, they have a whole bunch of big ugly names. We'll talk about how we set that. Notice that they all have a host surface. They have a size, an orientation, and they have some information around their construction. Generic double pane. Oops. Generic double pane glazing and frame. If we were to go to our components worksheet and come across here, let me just do a little reorganization so we can see. So we have frame and glass information here with the name generic double pane has G value, has a U value of 1.6, 1.6. Where does this come from? What is generic double pane? Well, that's been assigned automatically by Honeybee because we haven't told it anything else. So just as with our assemblies, if we don't tell Honeybee what to do, it's going to make some assumptions. It's going to use some standard information. And in this case, for any window where we do not supply a construction, it's going to apply generic double pane. And you see the U-value 1.69. So not very good. Not the worst window, but not very good. Um, and so in the next section when we come back, so we, we successfully have all of our windows here. In the next section when we come back, I think we need to turn our attention to the question of how do we gain some control over this? So we have some window surfaces in our model. They appear to be flowing through correctly. The geometry is flowing through, but how do we gain control over things like the names, over the constructions, etc.? So when we come back in the next section, um, we will take a look at that and um, uh, look at the different options for uh, assigning those parameters.